All right, good evening, everybody, and welcome back to another session of BEC. And this time we're starting on a new series called, called Apologetics. Yeah. So BEC is Biblical Education Classes, which is, uh, which is a ministry extension of Pantai Baptist Church. We're here to provide a unique platform where instead of having a majority talk and a minority Q&A, we're going to have a minority talk and a majority Q&A. And what that means is 30 minutes, we're just going to give a very simple talk. Uh, as, a, as a beginning of uh, talking points for questions and answers, which is actually the main priority of today's uh, session. So after the 30-minute talk, there will be a one-hour Q&A. And for this one-hour Q&A, you may opt to uh, unmute your microphones after the talk to go ahead and verbalize your question. Then the, then the panel will come up and, uh, and we will engage in that question rigorously and, rigorously and, and hopefully faithfully Trying to, find, trying to bring about the truth or the truth based on scripture. Or you can also uh, type out your questions using the chat feature in Zoom. So without further ado, before I begin, may I invite uh, Elder Chinchi, could you open this time with a word of prayer, please? Okay, sure. Father and Father, we thank you again for this evening that all of us are able to gather to, uh, for our Bible class. Uh, <coughs> Father, we thank you for the faithfulness shown by so many who want to know more about your, your word. And also for tonight, as we start, start on the series of uh, study on the apologetics, we pray, Father, for Pastor Mark as he share forth on this important uh, subject on how we can uh, uh, defend our faith as we are uh, called, Father, uh, uh, to... Uh, uh, in every situation to, to share our faith and also to defend our faith when we are being asked. So, Lord, we look forward for you to minister to us. We pray that you prepare our hearts and our minds so that uh, we'll be re uh, receptive to what you're going to uh, teach us this uh, evening. We commit all this the time unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Elder Chinshi. So we have come to a time, we come to the module of apologetics. And uh, as some of you who have been following us from the beginning of the BEC classes in January, uh, you have noticed that we actually are going into a sort of narrative progression. We are talking, we had a session, we had a module about God, theology of God. And then we talk about what does it mean to be a church. Uh, and then from there, we talk about Christ, uh, about Christ and salvation. And from Christ and salvation, we then move in into a module of evangelism. And now that we finish evangelism, I pray that we now have the mindset and heart to say, you know what, I want to share the good news to my friends, to my family, to even strangers on the street, because they truly need to know the good news of Jesus Christ. But in this uh, skeptical, in this modern skeptical, inquisitive uh, generation, uh, instead of getting a response of, yes, you know what, I'm going to believe in Jesus by faith and I will find out more about God as I journey with you, uh, and that's called discipleship, many a time they will actually uh, ask the questions first before they get in, before they consider uh, the faith, uh, they consider uh, putting their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So from there comes the need for apologetics. So with every evangelism, there will definitely need to be apologetics. So without further ado, let me just pull up my slides. And from there, and I will share from there. So this class is called Apologetics Methodology, where we will not only be discussing about what is apologetics, but how is apologetics usually done and what options can we consider and also what things should we be, should we be, uh, uh, should, should we be, aware of. Now, of course, these slides were done during my time as I am co-founder of Explain Apologetics. That's a local, uh, that's a local uh, Christian ministry in Malaysia to bring, about, uh, to bring about awareness and also training for apologetics. We have now changed our, our ministry name. We're now Explain International because Explain Apologetics have now gone into the countries like Kenya and Fiji and we're going and United States and hopefully we will go into the United Kingdom and Australia in the near future. But that's a different story. Now, on to apologetics. First off, what is apologetics? It's as uh, when people 
first look at the word apologetics, they think it is the art of apologizing, you know, so apologies. So we cannot, so we better make sure that we get our terms right. This is not about apologies, it's about apologetics. Apologetics is actually an anglicized word from the Greek. What it means is that they use the root word of the Greek and they anglicize it into becoming an English word. So what does apologetics mean? Apologetics comes from the Greek word apologia, which is to give or specifically to verbalize a defense, a reason, an explanation. Apologia is to give, to give by ver verbally a defense, a reason, an explanation. So reason and explanation is a bit more straightforward. When people ask a question, what do you mean by faith in Jesus? What do you mean that Jesus Christ is God? What do you mean when you say the resurrection? What do you mean when you say salvation? These are ap apologetic questions, clarifying questions, which requires a reasoning or an, or an explanation. For explanation, of course, is for the definitions. Reasoning is will be, why do you think that way? And the defense is when people are hostile and they begin to ask the question, you know, I don't think you're right. You know, is this wrong? to which then we ought to give a defense. This word defense comes from the legal idea where if you know some of the more famous are like law and order, there'll be a prosecutor and there'll be a defense. And the guy who defense need to plead his or her innocence or please, or that he, that what he is saying is true. So apologetics then extended out when it comes to Christian studies is the discipline of constructing reason arguments or writings in justification of something typically a theory or religious doctrine. So it is the discipline, meaning we are working on it. So as we read, we are trying to seek understanding uh, with the hopes of having questions ourselves that we can hopefully get answered by ourselves or with the help of others. Or maybe we may help other people's questions that we can help answer as well. Okay, and typically from a theory, meaning it can be scientific theory, philosophically, philosophical theory, it can be a metaphysical theory, or most likely, especially when we are talking about things right after evangelism, with regards to our particular things that we believe as a Christian. The word apologia comes a few times, but the one very clear one comes from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, But sanctify as Christ as Lord in your hearts always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. So this is Paul's call to the local church, that in all opposition, in all persecution, in all query, few, two things you should do. We should honor Christ as Lord in our hearts and be ready to make a defense for the reason that of the hope that we have in Christ Jesus, but we do so with gentleness and respect. Notice two things about this verse. One is that before we even make a defense, we must first sanctify Christ as Lord. We must assume Christ as Lord and Savior. Then only our explanation becomes a defense. If we don't regard Christ as Savior, and yet we talk about Christianity we're no longer really giving a defense because we have no stake in the argument, no stake in our belief. We're just basically uh, discussing, uh, either having an open-ended discussion or really having no bone in the fight, so to say. The second thing that you will see is that this verse is constructed quite parallel to the great command of Jesus Christ. Love the Lord your God of all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. So sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts and love your neighbors as yourself. Now, how does defense equal loving our neighbors? Well, our neighbors will have very sincere and honest questions that need to be answered. And those are the conversations that we would like to have. Not the ones that are just trying to seek an excuse to get out of the conversation, but rather the ones that have very sincere queries and concerns about the faith of the, about faith in Jesus Christ to which then when we give a defense, we're giving them the best answer based on the truth of the gospel. So how, and moreover, not only do we just give a defense, in a, not only do we give a defense, we don't give a defense in a condescending manner, but we give a defense with gentleness and reverence. That is a display of loving our neighbors as ourselves. 
So interesting thing about First Peter chapter 3, verse 15, and therefore how apologetics becomes that extension from knowing God and helping others to know him too. We can, so when we see, therefore, apologetics in the Bible, we can see that there are a few things that uh, apologetics involves, which we as Christian disciples, we ought to take in, we are to take into account. First of all, apologetics is a reverent preparation. We are not looking for answers to, to questions merely to tintillate our, our curiosities. We are, all, we are willing to go deep into the, into the hard questions and be able to face it with the reality of the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. So it is a reverent preparation. Meaning when we prepare, we're not just passing articles and say, oh yeah, just listen to this. But rather we ourselves are digesting uh, the things which we believe and the things that we know to be true in Christ Jesus. You know? And when we do so, uh, we, it, should therefore re, it should therefore react in our hearts to be a means of worship, either in a form of repentance of our lacking or in joy in his grace of saving us and having us know him more. Secondly, it is give, giving reason for our hope. This is opposed to giving an answer just to condemn another person. That is not apologetics. Apolo that, is basic, that, is basically, uh, that is basically discriminating. Rather, apologetics is in all the things that we believe, we try our best to show that there is hope behind the reality of this world, which includes the reality of God as Savior and Lord. And thirdly, it is a gentle and respectful defense. So apologetics, therefore, is not just merely to answer the question, but rather answer the questioner. And therefore, we do not answer the question, mere, we don't just merely answer the question with cold-heartedness and, and impersonally or apathetically. Rather, we give a gentle, respectful defense because we are answering the questioner. When it comes to faith, many a times, the questions that's given to us is very personal. And therefore, we do not want to seem as if we are stepping over the personal emotions and considerations and concerns about, about their question, but rather we want to uplift them and point them towards the gentle and gracious gift of God in Christ Jesus. So that's apologetics in the Bible. Now, there are two kinds of apologetics, okay? The first kind of apologetics is positive apologetics. Positive apologetics doesn't mean that you have to be positive in your personality, meaning you have to be happy-go-lucky all the time, but no. Positive apologetics is just being proactive in giving reasons why Christianity is true, okay? All right, positive is telling that Christianity is true. The opposite, therefore, or the reverse way of doing things is what we call negative apologetics. Negative apologetics is to give reasons why other worldviews are false. Now, why does, why, the, why does negative apologetics exist? Well, because we believe that Christianity is true. And if truth, by definition, is exclusive, meaning if something is true, that means everything else that is opposite of it could, would be false. For example, if I tell you that I am a married man, and yet another time I tell you I am single, I am not talking about the same status, and I'm probably lying in one or the other. Therefore, one statement is true, and one statement is false. So, that is, so with that, with positive apologetics, when we share the gospel that Jesus Christ is Lord, we therefore imply that every other lordship claim is therefore false. That's the negative. Another way of looking at it is when I say that, you know, I have, when I say yes to one woman as my wife, by default, I say no to every other woman. If I end up saying yes to any other women, it is either I have already forsaken the sanctity of, ma of monogamous marriage or I have redefined something which therefore may not necessarily be true. Now, what is the general approach towards apologetics in Christianity? Of course, we want our very best. 
uh, we, we, want our, we want most of the time of our apologetics to be positive. We would like most of our apologetics to be positive, meaning we just want to talk about the truth of Christianity. But oftentimes when people try and frame their faith, their worldview, their philosophy, their perception, which is contrary to the Christian faith, we will, gen we will require to gently uh, converse with them and say, uh, there's a disagreement here. There is a conflict here where one of the statements is true and the other is false. Let me tell you why mine is true and perhaps why yours is false. So we hope actively positive apologetics and therefore implicitly or passively negative. Yeah, There are uh, apologists out there that has made a career in negative apologetics, meaning a Christian minister has uh, taken upon himself to just be a professional of proving one particular religion or faith or worldview to be false. And that, and although they have their purpose in place as a specialist of a sort, that is not the general approach when it comes to Christian apologetics and sharing the faith. Yeah, so there, there we have positive and negative apologetics. How certain can we be? So a lot of times when we go to apologetics, uh, people will come and say, Pastor Ma, how sure are you that what you believe is true? You know, can you prove with 100% certainty? You know, so the question is, what do we mean by certainty? In philosophy, there are two kinds of certainty, actually. One is the incorrigible certainty. Incorrigible certainty is that I have made up my mind I have no way to improve it, modify it, or add to it, okay? So therefore, so therefore, my stand on this is incorrigible, meaning it will never change, even though I might find evidence that may be proven to be false, okay? Now, of course, there's another word for incorrigible certainty. It's basically called stubbornness. And of course, we as Christians do not want to be looked upon as stubborn people. But if we're not incorrigible, the other form of certainty is what we call epistemic certainty. Epistemic certainty is the idea for taking something to be true, but still open for improvements, change, or even to be proven wrong. Now, of course, you may look at me and say, Mark, you know, does that mean that we can never really truly trust uh, uh, Christianity to be entirely true? Well, that's not that that is a false statement. In when we when we are wanting to be certain that something is true, we don't go 50-50 on it. We actually take it to its logical, a logical conclusion and trust it full, uh, uh, full, we trust it full, uh, fully, yeah, we trust it fully. Let me give you an example. If you get a brand new car and some people say that RON95 is good for your car, petrol, RON95 uh, petrol is good for your car. And then another person says, Ron 97 is better for your car. How then do we deduce which one is true, which one is uh, really good for your car or not? So, of course, from a layman's perspective, what we do is we fill up our tank with Ron 95, we drive around for a week or until the tank is nearly empty, and then we will note down on how, how, is, our mark, how is our fuel economy, how fast can we go, how far we can go, how responsive is our, is our car when we hit the gas and when we press the brakes or when we want to cruise or we want to overtake. So we have all these notes and then we will test it down. Then we will fill up the tank with RON97 and then we do the same observations. Then we'll be able to compare, oh, RON95, RON97, maybe one of them is better or not. You see? Now that is epistemic certainty, meaning I will try one fully and another fully and then come to a conclusion. Okay. We are not saying that you trust something half and half because that will mean that, oh, I will take half a tank, RON 95, and fill up the other half tank, RON 97, and then let's see what, which one is better. You will never be able to get a pure or a pure or unadulterated result. So for, Christian, for the Christian faith, when it comes to apologies, do people say, how certain are you? They say, I take Christ to be true, 100% uh, uh, certain. Although I admit, I, I could be corrected, okay? Uh, but in the light, how likely is it that, uh, how likely is it that Christianity is false and near, but near to impossible? But then again, there'll always be this little bit of possibility. 
We just acknowledge it hum humbly, but yet there are some things which we can never turn away from. You know, and what are they? Well, we will get into that in the next presentation. So there's just two kinds of certainty. We don't want to be incorrigible and, and as if we're like, oh, we know all the answers and therefore there's nothing to be corrected. No, actually, when we live life, when we interact our lives with the gospel, when we interact our life with scripture, we will inadvertently have changes in our own faith and belief, and hopefully it will lead towards a direction of maturity. All right. Apologetic methods. What methods of apologetics are there? There are three kinds of approaches to apologetics. Okay. One is classical. Classical is the use of natural theology and evidence to demonstrate them. So let me bring out the laser pointer and I'm pointing here. So classical theology is a use of natural theology and evidence to demonstrate theism or belief in God. One example of classical theology is the use of the verse where, where the psalm says, the heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament of the earth displays his handiwork. Day and night they pour forth speech, night after night they, they witness his crea their creator. So classical, uh, classical apologetics looks it at the world and cannot help but respond and say, truly, there is a God. Another way of looking at it Another way of approaching apologetics is the use of scripture as the ultimate standard for all knowledge. This is what we call presuppositional apologetics or what we call word apologetics. Okay, So classical, the uh, classical apologetics, one person, one champion of it was, uh, was the late R.C. Sproul. And for presuppositional apologetics is the late Van Til. Van Til basically says that we can never truly know who God is until we have engaged the scriptures and assume it or presuppose the scriptures to be true, then we may see everything else make sense. Yeah? It's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like a, a, a metaphysical theory or, 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 a, or, physic, or physical theory or physical formula where I do not have the actual things up, but if I presuppose this formula to be true, then that will explain certain things or elements in the galaxy. So same thing, if I take the scriptures to be true, I get a very clear description or perspective as to what is really going on in the world. So with the word, we engage the world. And then the third one is what we call existential apologetics. Existential apologetics is rather a self-reflection on what we are witnessing. It captures the heart by appealing to human longings. C.S. Lewis is a well-known existential. He's a he's actually a literature major. He is a he is a poet. He is a, of course a fiction. He is of course a great classical writer. Uh, but in his writings, he displays existential crises and existential apologetics. One of his famous quotes is: "If I look into all the world and find nothing." And, 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 uh, to, and I find, try to find something to fill a void of my desire and find nothing to fill it. It will therefore assume that there's something more that is beyond, that is, uh, that is more beyond this world. Let me repeat myself. If I, sh if I have a desire in my heart and nothing in this world could fill the void of my desire, it then stands to reason that there is something beyond this world that can. And of course, he is implying God. So if we take a self-reflection of our own person and realize that, wow, you know, perhaps uh, uh, perhaps that there is a lacking in my life that only that only God can fulfill. And if I preach and if I if I take that position, perhaps then I may find true meaning, purpose, and therefore value in my life. Now, of course, the question is: which one is correct? Is it presuppositional? Is it classical? Or is it existential? In Christian apologetics, okay, while one would tend to lean on more on one or the other, I myself am a classical. I look at I look at all around, including the supernatural that which things are going on in this world, and cannot help but conclude that there is one true God. You know, some may choose presuppositional, some may choose existential. In the end of the day, we will end up using all three. Because how can we look into the world without engaging the word? How can we read the world without looking outside in the world and within ourselves? And how can we look at ourselves and not feel lost and not feel uh, and not feel lost until we look at the world and engage with the world? So all these three 
we will end up using one way or another as we approach to trying to find an answer or a reason for the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. So when it comes to explaining our faith in Christ Jesus, we will look at the word, we will look into the world and see how it's framed according to the word, and therefore we will look at ourselves and say, yeah, what is therefore my response? Now, in this apologetics, in this uh, approach to apologetics, here are some things to consider. Let me give you first an example. Some of you may know the, the character in this slide. His, his name is Samuel Neeson, the, the gentleman on the right. Before he became a pastor and a Christian apologist, he was actually first and, more, first and foremost a commentator for badminton. And he knows badminton. He's experienced badminton. He knows the nature of badminton. And also he studied the tactics and skill set of badminton. That is why they invite him to give an explanation as to what is going on, not just what is happening, but how is this happening and why is it happening? So one example would be, why is it that Lee Chong Wei is doing very, was doing very well in this particular game, but unfortunately he doesn't seem to be at his optimum best. Well, uh, of course, uh, so one could deposit that, that question and then, uh, that's, or Sam could deposit that question, oh, Lee Chong Wei did very well today, but it was not his best. And then, of course, the other person may ask, how do you know? Well, we noticed that Lee Chong Wei, usually he would be in control of the, of the shuttle and he will make the person run from left to right, front to back. But we see him oftentimes losing control of the shuttle and we, he also ends up having to move quite a fair bit across his side of the court in order to win the game. And of course, people may ask, why do we think so? To which then Sam may actually say, say things like, oh, you know, uh, now that he's married and, a fa married and a father, there probably is uh, some concerns at home that is probably causing anxiety in his mind. Or it could be that he had an injury while he was training uh, last week and therefore he is not in his full capacity to play the game. Either way, what he is, what he is describing is the game plan or he is describing the situation of the player or the game. All right? In all things, all right, the uh, Sam Nisan also one of the things that he's uh, called to do is that he's called to um, he's called to view and observe and explain what is the game plan that is going on at the in the in the badminton in the badminton court. To which then we say, oh yeah, we can see Lee Chong Wei. He was good in control, left and right and front and back, right? And he and when he thought and there were quite a couple of times where he tried where he where he feigned the smash, but he ends up being a soft pass. You see, so. There are so therefore, in order to to grasp in order to grasp and to and to utilize apologetics, we should have a game plan. So what is the game plan? First thing is we should create conversations which invite assumptions. Okay, we should create conversations that invite assumptions. So uh, one example is that when you create a conversation, you are therefore leading a person to uh, to, to have a, an assumption about anything. So for an example is, does it bother you that there is, a, uh, does it bother you that you feel something in your shoe? Then of course the person say, oh, am I feeling something in my shoe? You know, is there a stone? Uh, does it bother you that there's a stone in your shoe? Oh, is there a stone in my shoe? Could it be stone? You see, or could it be something else? The second thing is we should inform, uh, we should do information gathering and therefore expose the assumption. We then ask the question, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that I have a stone in my shoe? In my shoe? Or what do you mean by there's a stone in your shoe? You know, could it be, uh, is it just, does it feel smooth like a stone or is it sharp as a rock or is it, or is it uh, rough, uh, rough and metallic as a nail? Or is it something as soft as a feather? You know, so as we gather information and we are talking with the person, we are also exposing the assumption. Okay. Thirdly, we then reverse the burden of proof by and we refute the assumption. You know. So let's say, for example, the first the first conversation is that oh, you know, there is something in my shoe. What do I mean that there's something in my shoe? Well, when I walk, I end up walking very weirdly and very awkwardly on one side rather than the other. So there could be something in my shoe. Okay, let's prove it. Take off your shoe. Okay, take off your shoe and show the stone. 
And of course, you may take up the shoe and may end up be a stone, or it could be a pebble, or it could be a shell, or it could be a nail, or it could be just a feather. You never know until we bring it out. Finally, when it comes to sharing the gospel, we therefore clinch the discussion. Okay, when it comes to bringing out the truth of the matter, we then say, have you considered that perhaps that it is a definitely a stone in your shoe? Okay, so let me then, let's go back to the previous slide and take it from a Christian conversation. Yeah, so one, uh, or, or a conversation towards the gospel. So one example would be, does it bother you that there's so much evil in this world? You know, if God is so good, how can there be so much evil in this world? You know, so when someone creates a conversation, there is therefore an assumption, okay, there is evil. And somehow God is either involved or not involved in, 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 the, in the existence of evil. So we get information. Can, you, can, I exp can you please explain to me by what do you mean by evil and what do you mean by God in relationship to evil? You know, oh, I'm just saying that if God is so good, you know, how can there be so much evil? You see? So it goes to show that because there's evil, there's probably no God. Because if there is God, then there should be no evil. Okay? How did you come to that conclusion? You know, if you take away God, is there still evil in this world? I said, yes, there is. Okay? And more so there's evil because, because there's no God. But then if there is no God, if there is no God, therefore there is no good. If there is no good, how then define what is evil? Oh, okay. But then again, if God is around, how can there be evil? You see? Uh, so then we have a conundrum there, right? So how then do we put them together? And we put them together by, in sharing the gospel, we then tell them this. Have you considered that God is the definition of good? And we who rebel against him, therefore will definitely experience and witness evil because we are contending against God. And if you take away God, there's, you take away God, you take away the whole point of having the conversation of good and evil in the first place. What do we mean? When anything is such a thing as evil, aren't we assuming such a thing is good? If there's such a thing as good, aren't we assuming that there's a moral law on the basis of which good and evil has been, uh, has been established? You know? And if there's such a thing as a moral law, you have to assume a moral law giver, a person who we call God, who has the ability and non-biasedness to be able to tell definitively what is good and what is evil. But that is who you're trying to negate. That's who is trying, you're trying to, to, to deduce out or deduct out. But if there's no God, there's no moral law, there's no moral law, there's no, there's no good, and there's no good, there's no evil, there's no point to the conversation. So then we invite the gospel in. So don't just stop with saying, okay, there is a God, that's why there's good and evil. It doesn't answer the full picture. We then, we then invite the gospel into the conversation in that Christ, who is the source of all good, saw evil for what it was and, out of, and for the sake of justice of God and the love of God, he then, he then puts himself on the cross. That is why at the cross of Jesus Christ, evil is seen for what, is worth, what it was. A good God is rendering his judgment and yet, and yet giving it by mercy that in that the punishment is put on his son Jesus rather than us. And that's why we can look at evil and say, dear God, it is I that need forgiveness from you. So invite the person back into the very truth of the gospel. I'm sorry, going a little bit over time. Let me just, let me just conclude that when it comes to a apologetic methodology, let me just uh, exhort you to always, to, to always uh, uh, consider these three things. Number one, be scripture-centered. Be scripture-centered. Don't go, don't talk about mere, don't just merely talk about general knowledge of truth where it can be found anywhere and in almost any religion. Show how the scripture actually gives clarity and understanding to, and understanding to the questions that we're asking, that they're asking in regards to our faith. Secondly, understand the question. Okay, a lot of times when people ask about, so let's say you talk about evil, right? I may just merely answer the question of evil very, very nonchalantly or very uh, uh, from a distance, like one arm distance away. But many a times as a pastor and as many of us as brothers and sisters would know, the whole question of evil comes up 
when something personal has happened to us, has happened to the person, or has happened in society in general, the loss of a loved one, the sudden, the, the atrocities that's happening around the world, that could be the more triggering point to the question. And maybe we should be more personal and say, hey, let's, uh, hey, why not, uh, uh, can I, before, we, while I'm giving you the answer to your question and while discussing about it, loving you, do you mind if I pray for you? Do you mind, do you mind sharing what, re, what is really in your heart and what, and what is really wrong? You know? And then we go from a more personal and have a more direct approach. Thirdly, have a game plan, meaning don't just go into a conversation, you know, knowing a bit but not knowing the whole thing. It is okay to say, I don't know. It is okay to say, I don't know. If a person comes up to you and asks a question, you know, Mark, can God create a stone that's so big that even he himself cannot carry? You know, you can just, uh, now of course, uh, 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 you, you can try and answer it, you know, off the cuff, but rather than doing that, it's always good to say, you know what, I'm not really sure. Can I come back to you on that? Can I do some research and let me get back to you with a, more, with a very honest answer? You know, tell me what you think. Tell me what you think, and I'll, and, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll check on that too. Have a game plan. And part of the game plan could also mean that, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not really sure. Let me get back to you on that. And that leads to another opportunity for the conversation. And finally, oh, uh, two more things. One is use primary sources. Primary sources is, uh, primary sources is basically going to the, to the place where the fact is stated, which is not just script, which is scripture, but also looking at the, looking at the statistics or the facts or the date or the data as it is first presented. Why? Because some people tend to just give a, a factual statement merely out of pure speculation. You know, one example, and it's a very hot topic today, is that some people will say that, oh, you know, uh, maybe some people are gay because they are born that way, you know? Maybe that, you know, that, uh, you know, it could be a fact, you know, that every one of us are, because we have genes, right? Maybe one of our genes is gay. One of, maybe one of our genes make us gay. And that's a fact, right? Well, actually, no, let's look at the primary source. And the primary source shows us that a statistic that a cert, the study that was done in MIT and Harvard also and Harvard also came uh, uh, came and, and analyzed that data. They took samples of quite a large number, thousands over, of uh, uh, LGBT community and they checked their DNA and they found no, no correlation to to, to prove that there is such a thing as a gay gene. They found 50 variants. They found 50, 50 points out of 1.26 billion points to say that they all have in common. But the problem is that those 50 points or so are not in sync into one another. How do I know this? I have looked at the primary source. I looked at the study. I look at the, I look at the survey and that is the conclusion. So that will negate all assumptions. They'll negate all, uh, negate all, uh, all hearsay, and we actually talk about the uh, actually talk about the source and the fact. Finally, of course, preach the gospel. We can come to have all kinds of conclusion of the arguments and maybe be satisfied intellectually, but at all times, for when it comes to apologetics, we should always be up to preaching the gospel. Share about Jesus and how He brings all things together. All right. So let me just end with uh, some concluding and remarks from Dr. Ong Meng Chai of Malaysia, Baptist Sem Malaysia Bible Seminary. When it comes to apologetics, he then recommends a couple of things. Now, one is interdisciplinary. Build on your shortcomings of systematic theology, historical theology, philosophy, and biblical studies. Meaning to say, uh, apologetics by nature will lead you into a deeper understanding of God. It can be in historical theology. It can be biblical theology. It can be systematic theology. It can be about philosophy, Christian philosophy, and biblical studies. Don't be afraid to do so. Don't be afraid. Uh, dive in it, dwell in it, wonder in it, and enjoy it because where we can see the truth, and the truth shall truly set us free. Secondly, apologetics should be multi-perspectival. What it means is that we should have different perspectives or different alternatives on the same topic or aspects of the topic. If something is true, you can have multiple perspectives that in, ends up leading to the main truth. 
Yeah. So don't be afraid when there are different ways of approaching the argument that actually enforces the argument or the, or the truth of the gospel. Again, just as what I said earlier, just as we always talk, always uh, uh, engage or frame things with the scriptures, we should also be scriptural. Never forget the aim of all apologetics, which is to preach the gospel simply and clearly. Finally, be humble. All, all this knowledge is not from men. All this knowledge comes in the end from the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Be dependent on the Holy Spirit as your teacher and the one who alone can convict the world of sin, righteousness, or uh, righteousness of judgment. Reason alone is not enough, and for some reason may never even ma matter as much. So we can give all reasonable arguments for Christianity and for the faith that we have in Christ Jesus. Oftentimes, it could be just sin that is still keeping their eyes closed and hardening their hearts. For them, therefore, we should pray and say, Dear God, please help them that you may soften their hearts, you may open their eyes, and they may receive your good news. And through your Holy Spirit, they may find re not just reasonability, but confidence, uh, confidence and certainty in your good news. So that is apologetics methodology. I hope that from here we will have the spirit or, or the understanding or the nature of what we are going to be doing the next few weeks, and that is to engage Q&A, engage uh, broad understandings and approaches or how should a Christian approach the questions and problems of this world in reference to scripture in defending the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. All right. Thank you, brothers. Okay. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Uh, we now come to a time of Q&A to which then I'd like to invite our panel to come and join me up on the uh, up on the platform, up on the spotlight as well. Let's see. I understand Brother George is resting, so let's, let's let him have his rest. Uh, Huisu is around. Um, Huisu. Brother Huisu, thank you so much that you're here. We're just going to be interacting with the questions that is available to us at this time. Uh, your opinion based on truth will be, will be greatly uh, appreciated in this uh, in in this uh, uh, time of Q and A. All right, so some questions. Only one right. so far. One so far. Okay. So after listening to Pastor Mark, can I say that apologetics is a tool that can only be effectively used by those who are theologically trained, or and that ordinary lay people will find it impossible to answer the way he has. Um. Okay, let me first defend myself, okay? Uh, number one is, uh, friends, I am not a smart theologian. Uh, if I were a smart theologian, I would not needed to have taken four years to come to a conclusion, to come to the conclusions that I have. Like, you know, uh, I think uh, anyone who has that desire to, to experience eternal life in the knowledge of God, uh, that, is a possible, that is possible and available for you. And thankfully, as we now know nowadays, degrees do not necessarily mean that you have knowledge. Uh, degrees just basically mean that you can learn something. Uh, but there's plenty of opportunities to learn, not just through, uh, not just have, needing to get a degree from seminary, but you can do so by just attending BC or uh, taking some public classes in, in seminary or even just watching videos online from respectable sources and resources that can really uh, boister, boister your, your questions and answers. And I pray also that you too will be equally satisfied and uh, full of wonder as you try and as you engage with knowing God and therefore experiencing eternal life. That's of course from John chapter 17, verse three, that this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God and Jesus, the Messiah whom you have sent. Yeah, so that's it. But any uh, brothers, anything uh, that you want to add to this uh, comment here? Yeah, okay. I think we, we give too much respect for seminaries. Sometimes <laughs> we think those people who have gone through seminaries, they are a class above the rest. I do not think so. 
because you see in my seminary, we have one guy called Ke Dr. Kevin Corner. He wrote many textbooks for seminaries and they are used by seminaries in Australia in, in uh, even other parts in the US and other, other places. And he has never attended seminary himself, but he was able to write theological uh, treaties and also books and, and uh, a lot of other articles for seminaries and they are being used as textbooks as well. And he had never attended one day of seminary. So I don't think we should be over overwhelmed or we, we feel too, too much respect for people who have come out of seminary. Yeah, it all depends on that person. Mm. Uh, you know, yeah, how much he puts in uh, his, his uh, honest day's work in studying God's word. How sincere he is, or is he doing it just to get a degree? Because in the West, if you have gone through seminary, you're automatically a pastor, even though you may not have a calling. Mm. And they end up very poor pastors. Yes. So let, let's not be overawed by people who have come out of seminaries. Mm -hmm. And I think for, the, for uh, apologetics is the same. I don't think you need to go to a seminary in order to get uh, enough knowledge. There are so many things that you can glean from the internet. Mm -hmm. And also there are so many reference books that you can read. And if you are really sincere, you ask for the spirit's uh, direction and guidance, you should be able to pick up a lot of relevant uh, materials that you can use to defend your faith. Mm. That's my, my contribution. Yeah, maybe I share something. <clears throat> when Peter gives uh, advice that we should be ready to make a defense of our faith and our hope, uh, obviously it's not asking the theologian Mm -hmm. It's just every lay Christian. Yes. And all of us must really, in a sense, explain uh, our simple faith in God. So it can be a simple question that asks you why you become a Christian? Why don't you become a Muslim? You know, it's something very simple, we don't really have to. But something that we must have a personal conviction why do we believe in the Christian God? Why do we believe in Jesus? And I guess it's good that we are sure of our own conviction first before we share. Then we are very sure of our faith in very simple terms without going too deep into theological argument and all that. I think that's good enough simple apologetics. Mm. Indeed, in fact, the, um, the moment a person asks you a question about your faith, you are, by, you are naturally therefore doing apologetics. And when you are replying, you're not going from the basis of any sort of theological course or class, you are basically sharing about your experience and your understanding of God through the scriptures and also through your personal experience of God. I think that is more valid or as valid as, more, in fact, more valid than any theological doctrinal degrees that are out there. And it's just as uh, simply as you are not, you don't, need, you don't necessarily need to be in a seminary in order to do theology. The moment you read your Bible and you're having a thought, oh God, are you like this? Or are you like that? That is actually naturally uh, theology in its, most, in its most basic form. And that is actually the basis of where we do all our theology and all our apologetics. While, there, while we're waiting for other questions, um, an article was actually passed around in some of my in some circles, uh, uh, on, uh, and uh, and the topic is very interesting in that uh, the title says that apologetics is for fools. You know, and in there the article writes about how you know um, apologetics tries to uh, seek reason and understanding of our faith, but oftentimes our faith does not necessarily. Uh, our faith doesn't necessarily be, it's not necessarily reasonable or in a sense that uh, we don't have evidence or hard physical evidence for our faith. And that's usually, and that's also because that God is spirit and therefore spirit being non-physical, you know, we only have 
history. You have the evidence of the record of the death and resurrection of Christ. And from there, you know, in the scriptures, we then go by faith and, of course, by our experience with the Holy Spirit. You know, so therefore, is apologetics therefore just for um, uh, apologetics just a, a mental or cognitive exercise that leads to no end? Well, let me just respond to that the, uh, very lightly in that in the whole of the article, the writer actually concluded concludes with, with this statement and that apologetics is for fools. And thank God that apologetics is there for fools like me because I will have my doubts. I will have my questions. I will have my concerns. And thankfully that because Christianity is reasonable, it's evidential, it's experiential, it's explainable, that we then engage in apologetics, uh, that we then start to discuss and explain about our faith and come to a reasonable conclusion with, uh, uh, in, in, in knowing full well that Jesus Christ is Lord. So apologetics has its place, but it's not the be-all and end-all of everything. We still have preaching, we still have worship, we still have acts of charity, we still have, uh, we have the simple and plain explanation of the gospel. And we just hope that apologetics will help aid to all those uh, other main things which the gospel calls us to do. Anyone else have any questions? If not, this will be historically the shortest Q&A session that we've ever had <laughs> on the ST. You can ask questions verbally as well if you don't want to type in. No worries. I understand that apologetics can be a relatively new field. Uh, it's a it's a new it's a new quirky word that is being used in uh, seminaries and among uh, uh, other schools of evangelism, but it's not common speak among uh, uh, within the church, within the local churches. So as we engage in it, I pray that we will be more familiar with it and uh, uh, and uh, engage and and be more engaging in the future. Okay, Pastor Mark. Yes, maybe sir. for the benefit of all our brothers and sisters attending this evening's class, can you maybe point us to some YouTube or some reference material of uh, good apologetics, you know, uh, teachers or apologies, and you know, maybe when we have time, we can tune in to listen to them. Would you have a list of them? Uh, Sure. Let me bring and, out that slide. Yeah. Uh, let me see if I have that. I believe I do. You got RC Sproul, you know, C.S. Lewis and all that. But uh, who are the, the other one? The current living ones? Do we mm. have any? Mm. Oh, um, currently, um, my, my, my area of apologetics of interest would be on the interaction of science and faith. And so um, some people come to mind. Let me just type out their names as I, as I explain who they are. The first one that comes to mind is a person by the name of William Lane Craig. William Lane Craig holds two PhDs, one in philosophy, another in theology. Um, uh, he, is a, uh, se he is a lecturer, a professor at Talbot Seminary in La Mirada, California. And he uh, defends and he has a very strong defense for the Christian faith in many in many angles and areas, but particularly in the area of cosmology on how the universe began to exist, and of course on the on the his, historicity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, yeah, or the reasonability of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He also and, engaged in a lot of debates, right? With oh yes, believers. yeah. Yes, uh, William Lane Cray has engaged with the likes of Richard Dawkins. He's mm. engaged with Christopher Hitchens. He's mm. engaged with uh, um, Sam Harris. Uh, Sam Harris on the argument of morality. These are big, big time atheist, the atheist people. And William Lane Craig has very successfully and very well, uh, well adequately responded and uh, and argued with them. Yes. 
another person that comes to mind would be uh, James Tour. James Tour is not really an apologist. What he is, he is actually a, uh, uh, a biochemist by trade, but he has given a very excellent talk on using chemistry to show the faultiness of uh, evolution, natural selection by, and evolutionary theory. Um, uh, one example that he gives is like, if you, bake a, if you try and bake bread and the bread was burnt and is black, what then can you do to repair it? And the answer is, of course, you can't repair it because it's been burnt to a crisp. So what do you do? You throw the whole thing away and you start again. You might be able to do that in a small scale, like baking bread. You cannot do that when it comes to organic, when it comes to organic chemistry and of course and the evil and trying to posit evolution. Because evolution, when they say, oh, there's a mistake, let's just add time. Eventually it will eventually it will be correct. No, you can't do that. No matter how long you leave that bread in the oven, it will always be burnt if it's burnt. You see, so that is one example. So James Stewart actually looks into it a lot more comprehensively. I would highly recommend you to find him on YouTube and listen to his lecture. Um, Frank Turek. Frank Turek is, um, uh, he, his ministry is called Cross-Examination. And he speaks uh, widely and broadly on, uh, uh, widely and broadly on a number of areas of uh, apologetics, particularly comparative religions, worldview, uh, meaning, uh, 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 comparative religions, worldviews, um, science, uh, uh, understanding sciences and ethics. Frank Turek would be a good one. Okay, before I continue, there's another question here. Are there examples in the Bible that Jesus was using apologetics approach to, uh, approach to address people? Absolutely. Absolutely. My favorite, my favorite of all favorites will always be when the Sadducees went up to Jesus and asked the question, Dear Master, Suppose a man marries a woman, and then after a while, the man dies. Now, according to the custom that Moses had given us, we are to, the brother is to marry the wife and so that they may bear children after the dead of brother's name. Now, suppose that after the second person, the second brother marries, uh, he also dies. And then he has a third brother who also marries and then dies. And this goes on to for the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh a seventh brother, and they also all die until finally the woman dies. On the, the Sadducees then ask, on the day of the resurrection, whose wife does he belong? Uh, whose whose wife does she belong to? Now, a few things to this a few things to this question from the Sadducees. He asks, uh, uh, first of all, if by the third brother he still dies, I will therefore question the the woman. She could be a serial killer. Okay, but never mind. Uh, we get to the point of the question, which is talking about the resurrection. Now, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. They thought that we, when we die, we all become nothing. We become annihilated. Yeah. Uh, but Jesus then looks to the Sadducees and says, you fool, you neither know the word of God nor the power of God. For in heaven, we are not, we are not, we're no longer given or taken to, but we will be like the angels in heaven all belonging to God. So this, so the way that Jesus answered the question to the Sadducees is an example of apologetics, whereby he is explaining the reality of God and how in Christ and how in himself and in the knowledge of what is therefore the new heaven and new earth, there is therefore a new reality. Another one that comes to my mind would be uh, Pharisees come up to come up to Jesus says, uh, you know, good teacher, let me ask you a question. Should we pay taxes to Caesar? Now, if Jesus says no, then he may be tried for treason and be executed as a criminal, and therefore he's not Messiah. But if he says yes, we should pay our taxes to Caesar, and no other explanation. The Pharisees would then say, ah, you see, he sized the Roman Empire. He can never really be the Messiah. So what would be the apologetic question here? How would be the apologetic approach to the question? Jesus answers it brilliantly. He says, give me a coin. Let me show you something. You see this coin? Whose face is on the coin? He says, Caesar's. And of course, the Pharisees says, Caesar's. Then Jesus says, so you give to Caesar that which is Caesar's. 
and you give to God, which is God's. When the Pharisees heard that answer, they were shocked because they were caught off guard and realized the truth. Now, of course, for us, we need a bit further explanation. What is Jesus talking about? If the coin bears the image of Caesar, and because the image of Caesar is on the coin, we give it back to Caesar, we should then ask then, what then do we give to God? We give to God whatever bears his image. And who bears his image? All of us. We should therefore give our lives to God in faith and repentance through Christ Jesus. These are some of the very clear examples of how Jesus used apologetics to clarify the gospel. Uh, moving on, on an, uh, perhaps on another brother that I can think of, uh, John Lennox. John Lennox is a uh, professor emeritus of mathematics from Oxford University. He has written a number of books on science and faith. Um, yeah, on, yeah, on science and faith. And he's also written books about uh, the book of Daniel on how we as a modern society can learn from the book of Daniel and find hope in Christ Jesus in order to renew and reform society. He also talks about, uh, has many times to uh, defend the Christian faith uh, in the face of communism during the, er during the era of the USSR. Let's see. What will be some other ones? Uh, Norman Geisler. Norman Geisler was a the noted theologian and he wrote the book on Christian apologetics and uh, he set out a very clear line and also therefore it's a long, many lectures are available by Norman Geisler on how we can defend our faith uh, in the face of different kinds of theology and worldview. And of course, if I may, uh, just do a shameless Gary plug in here. Habermas. Oh yes, Gary Habermas and yeah. Mike Lacona. Gary Habermas and Mike Lacona are, uh, they have something very interesting in common. These two people are first and foremost historians before they are theologians. Their PhD is not in historical theology, their PhD is in history. And using the scientific, the core scientific methodology of, of history, they then prove the reality of the death and resurrection of Christ Jesus. Gary Habermas, he supports what we call the minimalist theory of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, meaning look at the bare minimum, meaning we grant all the atheist historians, they're all parameters, and even that little evidence they uh, 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 the little uh, parameters that they give, we can still show as a fact that Jesus Christ died and rose again from the dead. Mike Lacona, he believe, he is the defender of the maximal fact theory, meaning uh, give me all the resources and, uh, and both Christian and non-Christian sources on the time of Jesus Christ, you will be able to find the, how the history had responded as if Jesus died and rose again from the dead. Yeah, so Gary Habermas and Mike Lacona. So minimal fact, maximum fact. These are, those, these, are, these are very, very good people. Let me also put in a shameless plug, plug in and recommend to you Explain International's uh, YouTube channel. Explain International, of course, is uh, founded by myself and uh, Pastor Samuel Neeson. You can find our resources available on YouTube. Uh, we, are, we are developing content uh, quite regularly, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to find uh, some interviews. We did some interviews with Wayne Grudem, with uh, Mike Lacona, and quite a number of other noted apologists and his thought, uh, uh, theologians as well, to help us have a better understanding of the Christian faith. Yeah, explain international. Uh, some of you may know Josh McDowell. May I also highly recommend his son, Sean McDowell, uh, where, he, where he also has uh, followed in the footsteps of his father and now has become a pastor, apologist, theologian. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so there's Josh and Sean McDowell. And uh, let me look back at my library and see if there's anyone else that I can recommend. Mm. 
reading uh, more uh, readable books like Lee Strobel. Yeah, Lee Strobel. Like, uh, case, case for Christ. Oh, yes. Case yeah. for Hope. Case for Christmas. Mm. Yeah. What we and, call the uh, case series. Yeah, case, so, case for Christ, case for the resurrection, case for Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, so he himself was a journalist, atheist, yeah. investigative journalism. Investigative journalist, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. he leaves no stone unturned, and he came to yeah. the natural conclusion that Jesus Christ is truly who he claims to be. Um, I would recommend some of the writings of C.S. Lewis. You may know, of course, the Lion, the Wish, and the Wardrobe, and the Narnia series, but especially uh, the Screw Tape Letters. Screw Tape Letters, uh, Pilgrim's Regress. And of course, uh, Chronicles of Narnia has a very nice, subtle introduction of the gospel through the character of Aslan. Yeah, so these books explains very, very well. Yeah. Yeah, it, it explains very, very well on how does one come to a personal conclusion that, Je that Jesus Christ is Lord, is the only hope. Thank you, Elder Brian. Yes, indeed. Lee Strobel in one of his books, I think, is The Case for Faith. Yeah, uh, case, for yeah faith. case for Faith. He interviewed many Christian apologists and you can find a glossary of all those that he interviewed uh, to be there. I think one book by Tim Keller also, one of his books. Timothy for, Keller would be the yeah. reason for God, right? Yeah. Timothy Keller. Right. Yeah. Um, so reason for God. And if I may also uh, int uh, if I if I also uh, recommend uh, very strongly the prodigal God. Uh, the prodigal God, which is basically a different take on the, uh, the, the traditional story of the prodigal son in scripture. And it actually leads us to a deeper understanding of how really God uh, did what did really give everything for us. Would you recommend any of the books by Ravi Zakaria? <laughs> yeah. Well, there is a book that I will recommend, but only because he's not the only author. Yeah. Uh, so there's a book there, uh, there that uh, where Ravi Zacharias was the general author, was a general editor, uh, but it's actually a compilation of articles by other brothers and sisters uh, in the faith, and uh, it's what we call beyond opinion. And I would look at those, uh, I would look at those very well, very comfortably, knowing well that uh, the testimony and also the facts within the book is very is very solid and untainted. Yeah, so definitely beyond opinion. Mm. Mm. May I also recommend uh, a book that I reckon that I have found to be uh, that I found available at Book Access? It's a book by Eric Metaxas. Uh, Eric Metaxas, yeah, Eric Metaxas, um, uh, Faith, God, and Other Small Topics. Of course, he's, the title is ironic, but God and Faith are not small topics, but uh, he's basically compiled uh, a series of lectures from uh, the Socrates in the City, yeah, so I will recommend also the Ministry of uh, Socrates in the City, where a number of noted Christians and theists actually uh, give very high pro uh, give high profile talks to very famous and influential people in Brooklyn, New York. So Socrates in the City. Can I ask also more, more readable books like Philip Yancey, although he's not really, I mean, he wrote a lot of books, but some books are as apologetic things, for example, The Jesus I Never Knew. Ah, okay. Yeah, uh, and all this, yeah. Mm. Uh, so I think quite good. And also, uh, 
like why does God allow suffering and all that. Some of these books are quite good. Mm. Mm. Uh, why does God allow suffering? Is it? Uh, uh, what's the title? Yeah. I I wait. I I have it. Mm. Hang on. Yep. I can also recommend our daily bread. Uh, our daily bread also actually has a discovery series, and the question and the booklets are and the booklets and articles that are available are written yeah. from okay. the apologetic standpoint. Okay, the title is uh, where is yeah. where is God when it hurts. Uh, where also, is God? When it hurts? Yeah, I think I mean it's more readable in a sense, not really those theology theology kind of basis of apologetic, but through uh, uh, devotionally. Yes, uh, through mm. examples of people's lives and all that. Huh? Yeah, so, so people say, really where is God when there's so much suffering, so much evil? Where on earth is God? Yeah, mm. so he wrote in a very readable form. Uh. Yeah. Our Daily Bread, I was, I was just saying that our Daily Bread actually has a, a discovery series where the booklets that they, that they publish from this series is actually based on questions that is rendered apologetics. Uh. So, why does God allow suffering? Um, how do we explain evil? Uh, yeah. Why why do we need the cross? Why do we why do Christians need the cross? You know, so yeah, so our daily bread discovery series is not like our daily bread daily devotional, but rather yeah. quite books. solid and books and booklets yeah. to really help you guide you through thinking of the questions apologetically and also devotionally. Can I also say that with all of these things, with all of these recommendations, nothing stands next to the Bible. Yeah, for two reasons. One is that uh, all the people that I've recommended, aside from Explain International, are basically Caucasian people from the United States or from the UK. Although they do brilliant work, uh, there'll always be a context that, you know, uh, the Malaysian context doesn't really entirely fit into the way that they're explaining things. Uh, so it's always good to use them as commentary. But of course, nothing stands. Nothing stands uh, next to the Bible, where it transcends, where truth transcends all cultures. Yeah. So it's rather the attitude and the approach to God as a looking at the looking at the Bible and looking at apologetics as a sacred as a as a sacred uh, endeavor to say that you know what I don't just want to read the Bible of God. I want to understand it, and I want to understand not just for myself, but for those who might not believe. And just by having that put that uh, that posture will greatly benefit your your daily devotion because you're no longer just reading for yourself, you're reading for the sake of others that they too may receive the same hope that you have. All right, with that. Uh, before we end, let me just give a couple of uh, announcements. Number one is next week we will be on break. Uh, we, will okay. we will resume back uh, in two weeks' time, and that will be on uh, the 2nd of August. Yeah, We will come back on the 2nd of August, where we will continue on the topic, uh, on the module of Christian apologetics, and we will be talking about the existence of God. Yeah, we'll talk about the existence of God. Granted, we as Christians, we assume that god exists and that's why we see that's what and that is the and that is the basis of our understanding of why miracles happen especially on the miracle of the resurrection of jesus but honestly some people will need to have a more a more um vigorous conversation of how do we know for sure that god exists to which then i feel this talk will be good for you and good for even good for myself as i refresh on the topic as well so we will have a break next week on the 26th of July and we will come back on the 2nd of August and we will continue on the series on Christian apologetics. Thank you so much, brothers, for being here on the panel. Uh, perhaps without further ado, could I invite... See, uh, Brother Abraham, since your camera is on, can I invite you to close this time in prayer? Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Father, for this evening of God. Thank you, Father, for the... This series on apologetics that we have started today. Thank you for all the other series that we have done today. We pray, O Father, that all of these sessions of God will help each and every one of us, O Father, to reflect further, that we may grow in grace and knowledge of your ways, O God. Not just, not just for our head knowledge, but O God, that knowledge 
we can apply in our lives of God and the lives of those that uh, those that we come that we come into contact with. Father, as we start on this series, help, with Pastor Mark of God, help him, oh God, give him the wisdom and insight that he needs, oh God, that he'll be able to go through these topics, that you have that help each and every one of us, oh God, to enhance our ability, be able to explain certain things, oh God, where their questions may come up, Father. And that uh, not for ourselves, but for many others, oh God, be able to, to give that right answer. As individual Christians of God, we all have to give Father answers for the hope that is in us, Father. At the same time, oh God, we do pray that this series will help us to better address more difficult questions of God, difficult circumstances that may be brought to us. Thank you. Be with us, oh God, as we depart. Help us, oh God, as we take a break for one week and then be back, oh God. In Jesus' name, we pray all this. Amen. 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 Amen.